happy Friday. Welcome to the show. Good to have you here. So tomorrow I get to go on a little ice fishing adventure. My cousins live up in Brooks, Alberta, which is northern Alberta, Canada, and they usually have shacks out there, warm ice fishing shacks, so I'll be able to spend a day up there tomorrow, do a little bit of ice fishing, get away from the house, which I desperately need. I've been here and stuck inside all winter, so this is going to be a nice little trip. Plus, my wife wants to get rid of me. <laughs> Not literally, but she wants to get away from me for a little bit, so this is perfect. I get away. Uh, all right. Um, yesterday I read the introduction to First Thessalonians, but the page before it has an introduction to the whole of the promise epistles. This is Paul's promise epistles. So this is what I'm going to bring you today. And uh, that includes all of them, which First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, and Timothy, and that's all the promise epistles. The blessed expectation of our Lord's return before the day of his indignation is the subject of these, the promised epistles, Paul's earliest epistles. It is the early opening wedge between those who received his ministry among the nations and those of the circumcision who looked for Messiah's advent after the display of his indignation and the destruction of man's kingdoms. The historical background for this change is given in the book of Acts. Though the doctrine itself is not found, not found there, because the Acts is a treatise on the kingdom of God for Israel. In the ministry of our Lord and his twelve apostles, his coming is always presented in its connection with the promised kingdom on the earth. It will be with power and great glory. Matthew twenty four thirty, Mark thirteen twenty six, and Luke twenty one twenty seven. His feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. Acts chapter 1, verse 1, and Zechariah 14, 1 through 5. All the predictions in the book of Daniel and in the, and in the unveiling of Jesus Christ will find fulfillment from then on. <clears throat> it is basically the inauguration of the thousand-year kingdom on the earth. It will follow an error of the most awful and terrific judgments mankind will ever be called upon to endure. And that's the, the great tribulation. So long as the kingdom was impending, these judgments also were hanging over the rebellious race. At first, Paul, like all the rest, confined his ministry to the Jews. At Antioch, where the disciples were first called quote-unquote Christians, there were none except Jews and proselytes. From this, he was, he was separated. Acts 13.2 At Pisidian Antioch, he first turned to the nations or Gentiles. After that, though he spoke to the Jews first, he proclaimed Christ freely among the nations, preaching grace. One of the first questions for these believers among the nations was, what shall become of us in the great judgments which precede the coming of the kingdom? Will God pour out his bowls of wrath upon our heads? In answer to this, the apostle is given an entirely new revelation concerning the future presence of the Lord. The believers among the nations were saved on the ground of grace. This is to characterize all God's dealings with them. Hence, they cannot remain in the scene, which is visited by his indignation. They must be sheltered or removed. Some saints in Israel are sheltered, but the new company, composed principally of saints from the other nations who have believed Paul's preaching, are to be removed, extricated out. Paul receives a revelation that long before the Lord descends in, in glory to set up his kingdom, he will descend not to the earth, but to the air, and his saints will be caught up to meet him there. Thus they will be above the lightnings and thunders of the terrible day of the Lord. In latter epistles, as the truth was gradually developed, more details were added to this glorious revelation. The Corinthian mind found difficulty in this doctrine. So the apostle unfolds to them the secret, the secret of the resurrection. 
Colossians 15, 51, and 52, that our bodies, which at present are adapted only to an earthly environment, are to be changed to suit the celestial spheres. The Philippian letter caps the climax by the added revelation that they shall be transfigured into the glorious likeness of our Lord himself. So that's the casting of an eye right there. As soon as we look at our Lord, we're going to be like him. Our bodies will be changed, adapted for celestial realms. We're not appointed to indignation. That's what that means. We're going to be extricated out of here. The great tribulation, what comes on the earth, these thunders and all the bowls in the unveiling of Jesus Christ, this is for the earth. This is the, the inauguration or setting up of the kingdom on earth when Christ returns and his feet is on the Mount of Olives. And we will come back with him. I totally believe this 100%. We're always with the Lord. So we will come back with him to set up this kingdom. The former resurrection, which is those who will be raised out of Israel, King David, like all of these, all the 12, everything, this is what's going to set it up. And this is going to happen when Christ returns. And we will return with him. So, happy Friday. I'm going to enjoy my little trip away this weekend. And uh, I pray that all of you enjoy your weekend. Have a wonderful time with family and friends and herald the evangel wherever you go. Illuminate the truth. So grace and peace and we will see you on Monday.